everyone. It's CCO Club Webinar Night number 77. We have a great club webinar for you. It's where we take your topics that you request in the club and we just kind of unpack them, answer questions, give a little more information. The question that had come in recently was directly related to a webinar we did the other day on risk adjustment and this person asked if we could explain a little bit more about meat when it pertains to risk adjustment. I have to tell you I read a great article this afternoon and it said uh, it was a wasn't per se an article, I think it might have been a lecture that they kind of wrote about, but it said, uh, let's see, you you want your meat to be well done in risk adjustment. And I thought, oh, that's, cor that's a correct statement. I wish I had thought about that. So in regards to risk, risk adjustment, we're going to talk about meat and what it stands for. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about the CCO Club because that's where these questions come from. It's really easy to find the CCO Club at cco.us forward slash club. If you need CEUs, it's a great place to get them. But on top of the CEUs, there's a lot of other benefits to the CCO Club because you get to answer, you get to ask questions and have your answers right away. Not only are there CCO people in the club, but we have a large number of subject matter experts, specialists in specific areas of medicine, and we have students, we have uh, coders who've been around for a long time, new coders. It's really an exciting place. We have a lot of fun in there. And you can get questions regarding billing, coding, risk adjustment, specialty uh, work in there and uh, also there's extended product support so tonight what will happen is after we're done airing this live stream of the uh, club webinar it's going to be sent off transcribed and the club members are going to be able to see the slide deck the transcription as well as continue the conversation on in the club regarding what we talk about tonight and and also have all of the resources that i use so that's pretty exciting another thing i wanted to tell you about is find a code now for years you know that i have been talking about find a code and how much i enjoy using find a code one of the main reasons i really like find a code is it has a teaching component to it. I mean, there's lots of encoders out there. Uh, there's there's lots of companies that invest money into developing encoders, and then they try to market to you. and 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 I'm not saying that uh, they're good or bad because technically all the content's the same, right? For the most part, but it's the extras and the way that they deliver it that makes the difference. And find a code, I. I fell in love with them a long time ago. I, I think it's one of the first encoders that I really um, invested my time to, to using. And I've used others, but I just always keep coming back to find a code. It's so easy to navigate as well as the education that it provides along with the codes. There's so many tools that uh, you can have access to. Well, today we found out that if you want to work with CCO, we've done this in the past and we kind of got away from talking about it, but if you want to work with CCO, you can get a discount. So you can get 5% off when you use the CCO link for find a code at cco.us forward slash find a code and go just use that link go look and see what they offer if you have any questions feel free to ask us you can ask them in the club or you can go into our free area and ask say i want to know more about find a code one of the great things too about it is that our bat technique is included in find a code so you can see where to bubble and highlight the codes that's pretty exciting uh, it's faster more accurate coding if you get used to using it and they have so many extra tools that will help you with denials and collecting more revenue 
by using the tools and finding the mistakes or what codes aren't supposed to be used together, et cetera, et cetera. Again, that's that's all in there. So I won't tell you any more about it. You uh, ask if you have any questions, but um, just know that it's one that we have vetted and I particularly enjoy. So now let's get to the meat of what we're going to talk about tonight. What does MEET stand for? And if you're in risk adjustment, you need to memorize this. Now, I'm real good about telling you whether you need to know something or whether you need to have it memorized. And this is definitely something that you need to have memorized. So it is an acronym. M stands for monitor, E stands for evaluate, A assessment, and T treat or treatment. One of the things that it's uh, important to understand is that when you're doing risk adjustment coding, you're working with HCCs, and that is all going to be based on the documentation that is provided. As coders, you know, you've heard me say we code for statistical purposes. It just happens to be a convenient way to get paid. Statistics are, are key. They really are. And the documentation to the highest specificity allows us to translate that diagnosis or procedures into a code set that can be used to collect statistics. Well, there's several organizations that do this for different reasons. One is for uh, accountable care organizations or ACOs. You also have the HVBP, which is Medicare's hospital value-based program, and uh, Medicare Advantage. Now, when I did risk adjustment, I worked for an MA plan, a Medicare Advantage plan. I worked through Optum, who had the UHE, or United Healthcare. They had their contract. They still have their contract. It's one of the largest out there. I learned so much, and that's where I realized that I had fallen in love with risk adjustment. If you want to be able to get the proper meat out of the documentation, then you have to understand the behind the scenes. That is also very, very important. And I really like this statement that I found in an article, so I'm going to go ahead and just read it to you. It says, for success with documentation, clinicians should make sure it adheres to meat guidelines if the meat is not documented to validate the diagnosis, the diagnosis will be rejected by CMS due to lack of evidence by the provider. Simple as that. And if someone asks you, what, what is the meat that I keep hearing about talk, when we talk about HCCs and risk adjustment coding? That's what it means. That statement right there. If we don't have the meat, behind the document or the meat and the documentation behind the diagnosis, then it's rejected. It doesn't count. And that also goes into if it's not documented, it's not done. Right. If it's not documented, if it doesn't have meat, the diagnosis doesn't exist. And uh, these diagnoses for CMS are captured every year. Every January 1st it starts over. So if you have a person that has a BKA, like a below the knee amputation, Every year on January 1st, that patient's leg grows back as far as CMS is concerned. And to show that that person still has that amputation on January 1st, then you need meat. You need something that explains in the documentation that this person has an amputation. Now what I'd like to do is take each one of the aspects of meat and break it down and give you examples. And I didn't use the same example all the way through. What I wanted to do, and I've done this before, and I think uh, uh, people have said this is really helpful to them. We're going to take one diagnosis for monitor, and we're going to take another one for evaluating and another for uh, assessing and treating, and then just kind of talk through with examples and why it's important and what you need to know regarding that. And hopefully that will give you a summation of understanding MEET and how that works in documentation. Let's say you're reading a document. It's a 
your PCP for the patient, and it just states, monitor the patient's hypertension. Okay, is that meat? Monitor the patient's hypertension. Well, who's monitoring it? Well, if they say I'm monitoring the patient's hypertension, that's, that's fine, that's monitoring. How would there be other ways that you could see that the hypertension is being monitored? And the term monitor is uh, not always what you think of it as being. Some people say, well, that isn't monitoring you looking at them and, you know, and seeing what they look like. You know, I'm monitoring their appearance. Well, yes. However, this statement that I found from Omni Health Media, I thought was really interesting. It said the term diagnostic test can be misleading as these tests are not used only for diagnosing cancer, but also for monitoring cancer progression. So when your person has cancer or hypertension, even though they do a diagnostic test, now a diagnostic test means we're trying to figure out what it is or any changes that are happening, right? It's not the same as a screening. We've done education on the difference between screening and diagnostic. So a diagnostic test isn't necessarily what we're doing to determine what the ailment is. However, it could be to monitor the ailment itself for hypertension. How do we monitor hypertension? If we have the patient take a medication, right, and the patient comes in and gets a refill, the provider is monitoring the, the ability of the medication to control the patient's hypertension, and therefore coming in for a refill is monitoring. Hypertension stable, refill HCTZ. There you go. Now, just because the patient's hypertension is stable, does that mean they don't have hypertension anymore? Absolutely not. It's being monitored because they are continuing their HCTZ, which is ultimately a water pill and a well-known treatment for hypertension. So stable, refill hypertension. There you go. That's meat. What about if you see uh, a statement that says hypertension, CKD4, appointment with Dr. Flood, nephrology next week for increase in blood pressure? So even though they're seeing a nephrologist, that brings up that, okay, we have the meat, we're monitoring the CKD, but can the nephrologist, you know, draw that? Why would you go to a nephrologist for? Hypertension. If you understand the disease process, patients who have CKD, which is chronic kidney disease, usually always have hypertension. If a patient has long standing chronic hypertension, that really wears on the kidneys. And so a lot of times they have an associated chronic kidney disease of some type, some type of problems with their kidneys. So much so, that there's an automatic causal relationship between hypertension and CKD. Now, if you're new to coding and you don't understand that causal relationship, you'll learn that as you're taking your coding classes. Ultimately, what it means is that if you code hypertension I10 or I10, and the patient also has CKD4, which is in 18.4, then that changes the hypertension code to, uh, away from I10, but to I10 point whatever, usually nine. Doesn't have to be nine, but that's unspecified. And then you would code the N18.4 also. So that's all the guidelines regarding that. But as far as risk adjustment is concerned, and you look at that and you say, well, I really can't draw that line, can I? Because that's a nephrologist and he's treating the CKD. 
well, he is treating the CKD, but there's a causal relationship between hypertension and CKD, and the nephrologist will uh, work with the, the diagnosis of hypertension as well. In fact, if the hypertension it gets worse and they can't stabilize the hypertension, it may be a problem with the kidney disease that's causing that. Thus, the PCP is sending them over to Dr. Flood. Since I create these, I get to come up with the names. Uh, and therefore, we're going to have Dr. Flood check and monitor the blood pressure because it might be a direct result of the patient's CKD. And they're the specialist in that. So again, it may sound like that uh, they're not doing hypertension and CKD. He would just be doing CKD. But that is a line for both, OK? What about the statement? And I did this kind of, uh, I use the, how you, when we don't write out things very much in the medical field, do we? So hypertension, take blood pressure every day for a week and report to office. Now, that sounds like monitoring, right? You're going to monitor the blood pressure for a week and make sure maybe the new medication is working or, or maybe the person's hypertension has gotten better because the patient has done diet and exercise and lost 50 pounds and they no longer need their hypertension medication. Maybe they've you know, resolved that to the point that the doctor needs to reevaluate it. So therefore... The patient is going to monitor their blood pressure every day for a week, write it down, and then report back to the office. So some people might say, well, the provider's not really monitoring. It's the patient that's monitoring. No, that's, it doesn't matter. The fact is it's being monitored, and therefore, it's meat. All right. One of the reasons, again, that I like FAC or find a code is because they give you so much more information. This is a direct copy of what was in the uh, content under I10 hypertension. It gave further explanation about hypertension. And it also went on to talk about the chronic kidney disease, which I explained a little bit. But what I wanted to show you, the benefit of it, is notice that middle part with the bullets. It says specify the stage of CKD based on the GFR and any other associated conditions. Now, we as coders, unless you're a clinician, you're not going to be doing that, right? You don't care what the GFR is, per se, because we are not a clinician or we're not a provider, and so therefore, that doesn't matter to us. We can't make that determination. However, we can use the GFR for meat. So if they are having a GFR run, then we know it's being monitored, right? That's a way to monitor it. And that's where it gets into that previous statement where diagnostic testing could be to monitor the progression of the disease process. If we have our previous patient that has hypertension and they're going to go see Dr. Flood, you bet that Dr. Flood is going to um, do some tests and get the GFR and see if that's causing a discrepancy or causing problems with the hypertension. Also, it just goes in for your information to tell you. All right, so we have a GFR 1 through 4, but in-stage renal disease or ESRD is going to be a 5, so they'd have a GFR of greater than 15. Uh, great to know that. Right? We can't diagnose, but adding that to our information, to our knowledge base, allows us to say, oh, GFR was done. Hey, look. This is a 15 or greater. I happen to know that that's pertinent, and the provider still has CKD3 on this patient. So um, maybe we need to query the provider uh, regarding the GFR. You know, is this the current? And there's proper ways to query, but you knowing that is going to allow 
you to assist that provider to get to the highest specificity by inquiring about it. Uh, heart failure. We know what that means, that the heart just can't, uh, doesn't have the ability to pump the blood through the body. And we have unspecified when the documentation doesn't contain enough information to tell us that there is a more specific code. Now, this is all directly related to hypertension and CKD. The, uh, they were just adding to your knowledge base. And you don't have to have this stuff memorized again. But being aware of it, just saying, oh, wait, the GFR, isn't that, it doesn't have something to do with CKD. Yeah, it does. Or go look at it, you know, when you see that. It's like if you're having a patient that has a, a GFR being done, something's wonky with the kidneys. And all of that is considered a meat. Other ways that we monitor is we do pathological tests. Now, you might say, well, isn't pathological diagnostic? It is diagnostic but that is also monitoring the progression, right? If we are gonna go and do further pathological tests, then we're monitoring. We could do a diagnostic test to state that this patient has cancer. And then we come back three months later after the patient's been getting chemo and we're going to test this uh, uh, tissue again and see or the radiation because we're looking at barrier or, or we're looking at margins and so on and so forth there's so many things that pathological tests can give us an in information diagnostic imaging the same thing monitoring could be done to see if the neoplasm has spread or even if the pneumonia has gone into the other lung or if it's getting better decreased pneumonia signs. Blood tests, of course, blood tests are going to give us, the, the most common I can think of is diabetes, right? We want to do your A1C and, and um, that'll help us tell if your blood sugar is under control. Tumor markers as well and genomics uh, also is a way to, to test and monitor. I'm seeing some questions come up. I'm just going to read them real quick. One says from Debbie, uh, a lot of the times I see them listed together, but there is no link made of the claim, but the true link of the progress, progress note and counter form. Yes, she's talking about CKD and hypertension. And Dharma says, am I right in thinking it is okay to code from a path report? Now, if you mean coding for risk adjustment versus coding for every day in the trenches coding for the encounter. That is um, something that I cannot answer definitively for you. How, because some say yes and some say no. And it's not that there's gray area there. It's protocol. It depends what type of coding that you're doing, Darman. And uh, risk adjustment, you, you can pull a diagnosis off a signed path report when the pathologist has signed, when you're saying that a cancer or, or a neoplasm is cancerous, okay? But it still has to be documented by the provider that they saw it, right? That they acknowledged it. And sometimes it's done in an addendum. Sometimes uh, the path comes back uh, before it's signed off officially. And that can be changed. There's all kinds of different CDI regulations and compliance issues. So if you're ever in question regarding that, Darman, you need to, to check with the compliance person in your office or the compliance office, wherever you're working at, and find out what the policy is. Because I could say, yes, absolutely, you can code off a path report because it's a provider, it's a pathologist, they're a doctor. However, <laughs> um, there are little nuances about that that make that acceptable or not acceptable for certain types of things that the pathologist is reading. But the main thing is that the provider has to acknowledge that. The, the, the provider that requested the pathology report is what I'm saying. So again, don't, don't take a yes or no on that. Really, there's more information. It's kind of like um, you, there is no yes or no. You, you can't say, you know, have you stopped beating your wife? Yes or no. It's like, oh, wait a minute. 
you know, if I say yes, that means I did. And if I say no, that means I still am. Wait, you know what I mean? So more information is needed. Can you do me a favor, Alicia, yeah. before you go on? Yes. Uh, raise your hand up so I know when to make an edit in this later. Uh, and then you can put it down. Uh, just pause your mic, like turn your mic off for a second because it's, it's clicking for some reason. It, it, that's a Bluetooth mic, right? Okay. Is it a Bluetooth? Yes. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of clicking every so often. Is it going out? It's not. It, I understand okay. what you're saying, but it's I, like I popping every so often. But yeah, continue. Did, well, I just wanted to see if we can. I break. got a new. Yeah, I got a new mic, guys, and I was so excited because it's in my ear. It's Bluetooth. The children showed me how to use it. It sounded good, but it is making little. You hear I that can, too? I can hear those too. Okay. Okay. And, okay. Okay. Now I'm gonna put my hand up again so he knows how to edit. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Now we're going to move on to evaluate. Let's talk about the process of evaluation. And um, it really includes all the information that the provider is obtaining from the patient and looking at the patient. So they're asking about the signs and symptoms. The, the HPI is where you're going to see a lot of the evaluation. Some people say, well, isn't it in the exam? Yes, it is in in the exam as well, but a large component of it's in the HPI. The HPI, if you take that and you revert that to like a soap note, that's the subjective information where the patient's saying, I'm so tired lately. I have no energy. Um, I tend to sleep all the time. I've got this headache that I can't get rid of. And I really don't know what the problem is, is because this is not like me. Uh, I'm not, it, it's not an emotional thing. I just feel really drained and tired. And so then the provider may prompt with more questions. You know, when you get up in the morning, do you wake up tired? Or is it something that, you know, you get tired after you've been moving around for a while? Or uh, with physical exercise, you're ti more tired than normal? Does this happen? You know, when did this start? Is there anything that makes it better? So on and so forth. So it's it's subjective. But the the uh, objective part of that is also in the evaluation. And the goal really is to determine by combining and evaluating all the information that the provider has to come up with a diagnosis, right? The proper diagnosis at the highest specificity. And then once they know the diagnosis, to come up with the treatment that works best for that patient. When I think of this, I the, the word popped in, in in my head, and it really is it is good, is that this works with gold standards. So when I found this in this scholarly document talking about evaluation and gold standards, I thought, that's exactly what I wanted to show you. What they do when they try to determine a gold standard to determine a diagnosis and a treatment that goes along with the diagnosis is they do studies. And our statistics that we collect through the codes help with this. You know, you are doing, what you do as a coder is so much larger than you're just getting the provider paid, okay? It is helping to develop gold standards. How do we know that certain medications work really well with certain diseases? Because there's a gold standard. How do we know these signs and symptoms lead you to a specific diagnosis? Because there's a gold standard that tells us that, right? And we're going to talk about some of these a little bit more, but this is just a little graphic that says you have participants, right? Say we're going to determine a diagnosis, what makes up a diagnosis. So you have all the 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 uh, these participants, and you're writing down their signs and symptoms, and that gives you an index of you know uh, the outcome is uh, the diagnosis A, okay, uh, but it could be the diagnosis B. So then you take all of that information is what became diagnosis A because of the signs and symptoms, and those what signs and symptoms made uh, that diagnosis B. And once you get all of that done, then you come up with a gold standard, 
okay? And that gold standard could, again, be diagnosis, treatment, it doesn't matter. But how that's done with the gold standard, you do index testing with positive and negative outcomes, and um, then there's an equation that works with it. Now, if you like this kind of thing, it's it can be very, very fascinating. I, for one, don't. I don't like that. But there's some people that I think have more of an analytical mind that really love this stuff. And there's a need for that in medicine. And the codes that we collect really uh, are, are part of this process. Now we're going to move to assessing. When we assess, I used to think of this as, well, that's just the diagnosis. But it's more than that. This was a really good statement too. With everything available today and EMS per, uh, today's EMS provider, you need some pearls of wisdom because we use that term for effectively assessing and successfully treating patients having difficulty breathing. And when I found that, I thought, aha, this is gonna be a really good way to show how the provider assesses and the documentation that allows us to have that line for meat. You know that I have a past in EMS medicine, really, really enjoy that. So whenever I see anything I get to read on that, you know, it kind of trips my trigger and it's a lot of fun. So when I found this, I thought, perfect, breathing, because that's the first thing you think about when you walk up to a person that's laying on the ground, okay, you, you know, you, you immediately go up and try to assess, is this person conscious or not, you know, and if they are, then they can respond, and then you assess their breathing. If they're unconscious, we need to know if they're breathing or not. That's the first thing. If they're not breathing, nothing else matters, right? If they're not breathing, it doesn't matter if they're bleeding or not. So the three signs for imminent respiratory arrest uh, with acute respiratory distress. These are things that they teach you in EMS medicine, and it allows you to comprehend. I think it's a great example of assessing the situation. And when you're reading this documentation, you'll see this type of documentation also in emergency medicine, or you may see it in um, the doctor's office or inpatient as well. When a patient comes in and the uh, they think they might have a really bad cold and maybe they have a really bad pneumonia instead. This is how the provider determines that. Okay, so in an emergent scenario, so we're assessing what are the, um, the three signs right away that this person's not breathing or they're in distress. Decreased level of consciousness. They're either not awake at all or they're not coherent, we can't really wake them up, or they're not responding properly, right? That would be decreased level of consciousness. Inability to maintain respiratory effort. So it's just a huge struggle to get air in and out. And cyanosis, which means they're turning blue. Whenever you have uh, one or more of these, then you definitely have a person that's going, going downhill fast. And ultimately, if they're not already in cardiac arrest, they could be very shortly. So the next step is, why are they not breathing? Why is there a problem? And there are several things that you can look at. There's 10 that you have to run through your mind very, very quickly. So this is how the provider assesses what could be the problem. We have, let's say, a person that's really struggling with breathing and they are conscious, but you're noticing that their, their lips are starting to turn a little blue around, you know, getting a little cyanotic. What's the problem? Could they have a foreign body in their airway, right? If you walk up to somebody and they... Uh, uh, especially if they grab their uh, people who are choking, they grab their throat like this. And um, so in the assessment, you can definitely tell by mannerisms and movements what people are doing. If they're having a heart attack, they grab their chest and they, they hunch in on themselves. But if they're choking, they're grabbing at their throat. All right. Uh, acute coronary syndrome could cause it. Uh, acute heart failure, major arrhythmias. So a person could be an AFib, uh, 
and that would cause breathing problems. Tamponade, meaning that uh, ultimately it means the heart, the lungs are being squished by something. Was it air? Is it blood? Massive pulmonary embolism, they threw a clot. Pneumonia, there's fluid in their lungs. Exacerbation of COPD or asthma. Uh, anaphylaxis, they're in a restaurant and um, you know you you see somebody who's struggling and they they get up and they're grabbing at their throat and you think oh my word they're they're choking but a person that's in anaphylaxis isn't doing this okay that's a choking thing a person that's in anaphylaxis is usually just concentrating getting air in and out uh, uh, and they're swelling in other places usually they're very panicked uh, or poisoning or trauma. So when you look at one of these scenarios and the the provider is trying to assess what what are we doing, they're going to start going through the signs and symptoms and evaluating or assessing, right, all the information they're given from being able to view the patient being to, to see how the patient's reacting. Are they grabbing their throat? Are they grabbing their chest? You know, um, are they uh, down on the ground? Can they not stand up anymore? Uh, are they panicked? Are they unconscious? Can they talk? If you could talk, um, then you're getting air back and forth. You're not choking. So whenever a uh, person's coughing, you know, and they say, are you choking? like well if you hear them coughing they're not choking because you can't cough uh, no air comes back and forth when when that stops uh, if they stop coughing they may not be able to talk but if they stop coughing that's a problem all right so they're assessing all of this imagery that they've got in front of them and then their assessment goes to touching and feeling you know are, are they cold and clammy it, are they sweating profusely and not breathing well? All right, well, now we're starting to think heart issue, not lung issue, right? Um, and uh, maybe there's major trauma to the chest. Oh, okay. Or they're bleeding all over the place. Okay. Why are, now the breathing is a direct relation to the, a bit of, uh, there's no blood for the oxygen to move around in, that type of thing. Also, when you're assessing a patient, some other terms that you're going to see in documentation that shows you how they assess, how the provider is assessing or the clinician, whoever the caregiver is. Is your patient having trouble um, uh, without any immediate life uh, threats? Okay. Or do you, can you, uh, can you focus directly on the patient's ability to breathe for themselves? So when we look at the patient, first thing, are they using accessory muscles? A great way to see this is in a child. Uh, you can go to a YouTube video and just put in shortness of breath, um, child or toddler or infant, infant probably is better. And you can see accessory muscles being used. Now, if any of you have uh, uh, grown up with asthma, or you know what that feels like, <laughs> if you've had an asthma attack and you get relief, but you've had an asthma attack for a long time, the next day you're usually pretty sore because you're using accessory muscles to help you breathe. Uh, you're, pro you're doing it unconsciously most of the time, but your diaphragm does all the work. You don't need the muscles, really. The, the diaphragm does it. But if you're like getting barrel chest, you're, you're trying to expand yourself to get the air in and everything, then that's using accessory muscles. And it's so easy to see this in children. They'll take the, their, um, the top half of their clothing off and you can see those chests and that abdomen go suck in real far and then bow, bow out and then suck in. Uh, you, it shouldn't be that hard to breathe. So the child is, and your, your nares, this, your, your nose, uh, your nose holes are called nares. You start, you know, you see them and I can, I find, uh, whenever I've had asthma attacks, I found myself doing that. You don't realize you're doing an aversion. You're, you're just trying to, anyway to get more air in. Inability to speak full sentences. 
that is also an indication that the person is not able to breathe properly. And sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it. I have had um, conversations on the phone many years ago when I was having a lot of problems with asthma. And I would answer the phone and someone say, did you, did I catch you at a bad time? No. And they said, well, you sound really out of breath. Did you have to run inside to get the phone or did you just walk upstairs or something? No, I was just sitting here, but it sounded like I had gone up a flight of stairs. And when I would talk without even knowing it, I couldn't say a whole sentence without, <gasps> you know, and someone observing you, assessing you catches that. And the patient may not even uh, to get it because they're just doing that for so long. They don't even realize it. Inability to lie flat is called orthopenia. And um, if a person's having difficulty breathing, you don't want them to lie flat. You, it, it makes all of the chest muscle and the weight of the chest, the rib cage and everything, uh, weighs on the lungs. So you want them to sit up and then it's easier to expand those lungs. And that's called orthopenia. They get more short of breath when they lie flat. Extreme diaphoresis just means you're sweating. Now it's one thing to sweat, but it's you're sweating profusely. You know, and, and they may even notice that's like, oh, my word, I just started sweating and my chest hurts. Now, if a person has, say, GERD, they're usually not sweating. They may have a lot of other, they, they can have chest pain. They can have shortness of breath. Um, they can have a lot of the signs and symptoms. It can be definitely uncomfortable to lay flat. Uh, but with GERD, you don't break out in a sweat. And that's a big indicator. Uh, Restlessness, agitation, or declining level of consciousness. You can always tell when I first start having trouble breathing, not if it's been going for a long time, but that first time because you get agitated. Uh, if you've ever met a person with emphysema, they're, <laughs> they're usually not nice people. And I don't mean that they're, they're not jolly people. <laughs> They're struggling to breathe. Every breath they take is a challenge and a struggle to get air in. And it, quite frankly, makes you cranky uh, to, to struggle breathing. So, uh, you know, little things annoy you when you can't breathe, <laughs> when you're just concentrating on just, you know, surviving. One of the great tools that's around now that's common, anybody can buy one, is a pulse ox. These pulse oximetry readings uh, allow you to see if the person's really having difficulty with breathing and the exchange of oxygen versus struggling for other reasons not to be able to breathe. So let's say, for example, uh, the person has a history of GERD, uh, so they think it's heartburn but they're having chest pain, they can't lay flat, they're struggling with breathing, and they're really, really uncomfortable. So you put a pulse ox on them. Now, if they're having a heart attack, they're most likely the pulse ox is going to show they're not getting good oxygen. Uh, if a person has GERD, they're not going to get cyanotic, right? Oxygen's getting through, it's just really painful. But we're assessing to determine the gold standard, is it GERD? Or are they having a heart attack this time, right? And and since you know both scenarios this patient could have, you've got to determine. And, and things like a pulse ox will, will allow you to do that. If they're having chest pains, um, can't lay flat and everything, but they've got a pulse ox of 98, they're good to go, right? But you get below 94, and uh, now something else is probably going on, and we need to... Uh, uh, you know, get further testing done. We need to get further testing done, period. A, other things to think out of is that, you know, in the past when I was doing EMS medicine, as soon as you walked up to a patient, you slapped oxygen on them. There was just, they trained you to do that. That was just what you did. Uh, oxygen makes everything better, no matter what. You know, well, now they've found that's not necessarily true. In fact, sometimes they won't put oxygen on a person that's having a heart attack because of, uh, uh, reasons on a higher level that I can't remember all the details to, but they're thinking that it, it can be damaging to the part of the heart <clears throat> that's not getting the oxygen and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, so it's not the go-to like it used to be. 
uh, it can also kind of hide some symptoms. If you put oxygen on a person and you do a pulse ox, well, you're pumping oxygen into their body, so their pulse ox, which reads how much you know oxygen's in the bloodstream, the it it may give you a false reading, right? Uh, and so uh, again, we they tend to not do that. Now there are definitely reasons for oxygen, but it's not that first go to because it all has to do with the assessment. And knowing all of this, what you've seen so far, tells you, what am I looking for in the documentation? You know, it is ortho, does the patient have diaphoresis? Are they, do they have orthopenia? Uh, what are the signs and symptoms that are leading the provider this way or that way, right, to get to the highest specificity? Now we're gonna wrap up with treatment. It's the last part of the meet. And um, I, just pick coronary artery disease because it's pretty broad, right? Uh, artery disease, there's set different levels of uh, CAD, but I picked two places to get information from. One was Mayo Clinic and the other one was um, the Cleveland Clinic, both very reputable places. And um, so what's the treatment? Well, there's First, personal treatment. If you, if they know that you are likely or you're starting to have signs and symptoms of CAD, they're definitely going to encourage you to do this personal treatment. Don't smoke. You know, if you're, if you're a smoker, you need to stop. You need to change your diet and consider healthier foods. You need to get up and move get active. You need to probably lose any excess weight that you have and you need to reduce your stress. Okay. Those are simple things that could make you feel a whole lot more comfortable faster than if they start onboarding a lot of information, you know, stuff to you. Now, that's the basic, uh, minimus, minimalist type of thing that they can do for you. And the most extreme would be surgery. Let's give this patient an angioplasty, put in a stent, or let's do bypass surgery. That's the extreme of a surgical approach that they can use for treating CAD, depending on the rest of the meat that they've done. Okay, other treatments, they have alternative medicine that you might see documented. And quite honestly, when you're doing risk adjustment, the meat, more meat, or that line that you have to draw to set, show that it's actively being treated is from the treatments. And the go-to is usually medication and stuff like that. But could you see that the patients, um, uh, the doctor suggested that the patient try flaxseed or the patient be on a fish oil supplement and or, or other uh, omega-3 fatty acids? Absolutely, you could. And that could be a line indicating that, yes, the patient's being treated for CAD. Alternative medicines still count as long as they're acknowledged by the provider that they're being used to treat the CAD. Other things, statin therapies, we're going to talk about those a little more in depth. We got to lower the the patient's cholesterol. And that means that we're probably going to be looking at the meds the patient's on, as well as aspirin. Anytime the patient's on a cholesterol medication or on aspirin, it definitely could link to CAD or, or a numerous amount of other um, cardiovascular diseases. So you want to be very aware of those. The medications that are very common to treat CAD besides the aspirin uh, and cholesterol medications would be beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, uh, renazoline, uh, nitroglycerin because they have chest pain, and ACEs or uh, angiotensin converting enzymes. And um, this is this is where your knowledge of medications really plays a part in being able to get meat for risk adjustment, knowing what medications are used to treat what diseases. With CAD or any type of heart medications, it's really, really, uh, really broad. And if you aren't familiar with this type of um, treatment, 
the medications, I encourage you to pick up a pharmacology course. And, you know, CCO has a fabulous pharmacology course that you, you could take. It's uh, pretty easy to get through. It's really intense with knowledge. However, it's not intense to get through. It's fun, in fact. And that wraps it up. Let's see, questions. I'm going to go look up here. I, I saw things popping through. Denise says, I agree with the assessment. When I was an EMT 30 years ago, it was similar. ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. I know <laughs> one of the EMTs that I worked with, this, this uh, she was older, everybody was older than me back then. I was one of the youngest ones in our group. But um, she had a code that they went out on. And um, for whatever reason, I can't remember. I remember uh seeing her come in though because i was working in the er and she was working in the ambulance and she was a little thing and they uh they had her uh on the gurney straddling this guy and that's not how you do cpr but they had her on him straddling him doing cpr okay as they were coming in to uh to the er and now mind you again this is over 30 years ago and we didn't have a lot of fancy equipment <laughs> in this rural area where we were from, but um, they didn't have oxygen on him. They actually had strapped oxygen on her. Now, part of the reason, I think, is because they only had uh, three people to run that code. One person to drive, one person to that was a paramedic that could onboard meds and so on and so forth. She was an EMT. So she couldn't do anything else, really, uh, as far as intubating or, or so on and so forth. And so she was she was pumping away, you know, and um, and she was worn out. She was a little thing. So I think twofold. They put the oxygen on her uh, to give her a little more of a perk and energy, and um, that also in turn was um, helping him because the. Um, uh, they were trying to get an IV started and so on, and she was actually doing uh, respirations as well as compressions. Back then, we did them both when a person had a heart attack. Now, you just kind of do respiration. Or, uh, uh, the, the breathing part is not as important as it used to be. Let's see. And then we have uh, Whitney says, would hypovolemic shock fit in there? Yes, absolutely it would. It could definitely be one of those things. So what you do is you take those gold standards and you say, well, because we have ABC, then it's, you know, then it's this diagnosis. But if we have BCD, it's probably this, this other diagnosis, you know, things like that. So yeah, uh, those same signs and symptoms and those conditions, definitely hypovolemic shock. Um, let's see. Yes, I, I really enjoyed working um, in emergency medicine, and I really enjoyed working in a pharmacy. I get to work five years in a pharmacy, and I learned so much doing that. So uh, sometimes people talk about not being able to get their coding, get into coding right away when you get your credentials and stuff. But you know what? Sometimes if you need to pick up another job doing some pharma, you know, working in a pharmacy, uh, you know, just there's so many options out there that will increase your knowledge base. Yeah. And there's our references. And there you go, guys. I think that's it on the questions. Don't forget, if you want to follow this conversations that we're having, uh, go ahead and we'll still discuss this in the club. Uh, maybe you've got some experiences that you want to talk about, but ultimately, to sum this all up, meet for risk adjustment is what it's all about, right, but for the risk adjustment coder. We have to establish meet, and we have those ways to do it, you know, each one of those, and you only have to have one out of the four, okay? Most of the time, it's the treatment that that we're pulling from and most of the time that is the the prescription list the farm pharm pharmacy uh, list as well as what are they doing are they sending the patient someplace else to get a uh, more testing done so uh, the more you see it the more you read it the experience that gets under your belt it becomes faster and faster but again the more you know 
the faster you are because you just have to look at that diagnosis, look at the med list, good, that one's good to go, flip the page, right? Now, if you have to go in and say, oh my word, there's like five medications here and I don't know which one's a heart medication and which one's a cholesterol medication and, you know, uh, and what was that medication? Maybe that was a sleep medication. I can't remember. Uh, so, uh, you know, could that medication be used for, for prostate and, uh, they use generic terms so much. Now, name brands, sometimes you can get like Flomax, definitely going to be something used for urinary output, right? Flomax, <laughs> it's often used with men with prostate cancer. Uh, I know when my mother-in-law had her knee replaced, they she was having problems with urinary retention after because of all the anesthesia they'd given her, and she's sensitive to it and stuff. So she couldn't urinate. She came home with a, a catheter, and they put her on Flomax. And she said, wait a minute, that's old man medicine, right, when their prostates go bad. Women don't get Flomax. No, women get Flomax too. But you're right. It's usually a medication that men take for prostate problems. Okay, guys, don't forget to go cco.us forward slash club. Tell your friends. Tell your friends about the club. Like and share this video as well as uh, go out and check out Find a Code. And don't forget, you can find that easily at cco.us forward slash find a code. All right. Bye, guys. more medical certification and business training? Learn more at www.cco.us.